Well, good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you today about a lamp that shines. I did have another title for this, was to uh, turn the big light on. The reason why I say that is uh, most of you who are married will have the understanding that there are some partners who prefer to put the main light on when they're doing something, and some partners who like to put the side lights on. Um, I'm one of those people who likes to have the big light on, partially because I'm short-sighted and I like to see what I'm doing, but as soon as I've switched the big light on, I can guarantee that my wife will come at some point and say to me, why don't you put the side lights on? Put a lamp on. It's more aesthetically pleasing, all those kind of things. But when we're talking about the light that we're going to be looking at today, there is no side light. There is no uh, aesthetically pleasing notion. This is the main thing. And we're going to look at light and why it's important, but not just what light uh, is, but also what Jesus means when he talks about the light. We're going to look at Luke chapter 8, verse 16. So if you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me? I'm reading from the NIV. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. I can get, I can get behind this message. You put the main light on. It's not hidden. It's not diffused. You see the light. It's put on display. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. All of a sudden, when you hear words like that, you, you're, the back of your hairs go up, don't they? Because as human beings, we like to put on a face. You know, that which is outside and that we show to others is all our good stuff. I mean, that's what Facebook's all about, isn't it, really, and social media. Often when you read Facebook and social media, it's, it's all the so-called good stuff, particularly for those who are children of God. But it's very rare that you see the stuff that's not so good. We don't like to publicize when things aren't going well or when we make mistakes through our own weaknesses. So when we hear Jesus talking here and he's saying, for there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, the panic button can turn in, can't it? Often, I don't know about you, when I read scriptures like this, I imagine the end of days and being in front of the judgment throne and all of a sudden there's a video on the screen for everybody to see of my life and all my problems and all my issues. And that's why I like to keep short accounts. You know, because the scriptures are very true in the promises, what they say, that if you keep short accounts and you make right your wrongs and apologize for everything that you've done, it's been taken away from you as far as what? The east is from the... That's beautifully reassuring. You know, we sometimes refer to repentance as a one-off experience. It's a lifestyle. I don't know about you, it's a lifestyle. I'd love to say I have it all, the answers and all the solutions and all the different things and everything's going great in my life, but I find in my life it's just even the small things. I need to come to God and say, Lord, forgive me. You know, when I am not that example that you want me to be, when I've fallen short of what you've done for me, and he is more than gracious, to forgive you. That's the beauty of the Savior that we worship. He is the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Be careful that we don't become politicians. We're 
promises to the world and to everybody else. But we like to manipulate what's going on so that we can get the best for ourselves. Or alternately, you know, we have to conceal things because we want to protect things. But there is coming a day, there is coming a time when everything will be opened and everything will be seen. And that day is coming soon. Because when we die, it's instantaneous for us. Have you ever thought about that? We come out of the time frame of this earth and we come into the eternity and the heart of God. It will be in an instant in the blinking of eye. All of a sudden we will be with Jesus. What does he say to the guy on the cross? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now I have to work that out in my mind and in my theology and in the scriptures that are all talking about where Paul talks about being asleep. Do not be negligent of those who are asleep and have gone to be with the Lord. I think that's really talking about the bodily resurrection. But there is a sense in our spirits. Just as we give our lives to the Lord, there's a born again experience. We become part of the resurrection. So when we go down in the water in our baptism, it's symbolizing the resurrection. We are of the resurrection. Maybe not yet in the flesh, but in our spirit we taste it of the age to come. And we will see it in full. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. I think that's an important scripture because it interprets the whole passage. What are we talking about when we're talking about light? Well, Jesus has just highlighted it here for us. Consider carefully how you listen. The light is something that needs to be listened to. Needs to be received. It needs to be obeyed. It needs to be embedded into your very being and outworked through your entire life. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken away from them. Short passage. Uh, it's full of symbolic imagery. I, I started reading this passage and it just grew and grew and grew when I was thinking about it. But I, I think the key verses that open this context for this passage can be found in, in verse 15, which is before, where Jesus is talking about the seed that's been sown. And some of the seed lands on bad soil, some of the seed is swallowed and taken by the birds, some of it's choked out by the cares and the worries of life. But there is seed that lands on the good soil. And so when Jesus is saying these words here, even what they think they have will be taken away from them, he's not talking about the good soil. He's talking about all the other actions in which the seed has landed in where there has been a deposit or something has come and it's spoken into a person's life and they've allowed it to be snatched away either by the cares and worries and anxiety of life or even because they've just seen something new. Wow. You know, I don't know about you. Um, there's a particular film, I think it's a child film, called Up. And in that film they have this dog and they put this voice box on this dog and it can start to speak and interact to the in, in, inventor. But all the time, the dog is obsessed with squirrels. And so somebody would just mention the word squirrel and it'd be like, <laughs> where, 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 where's the squirrel? And we can sometimes be like that, can't we? In our distractions, something new's come, something has entered in, and we're, we're like, oh, I need to look at this, I need to do this. I need to do that. But when it comes to the light, we need to make sure that we are not distracted from the light. In verse 15, 
it talks about the seed and it says that the seed is the word of God that has come. It's been received. It's produced a crop. It's been fruitful. And then also as we go further on in verse 21, Jesus, after he's mentioned about the lamp on the stand, starts talking about who his brothers and mothers and sisters are. And he says in this verse in 21, he replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So when we're talking about the light, we're talking about the word of God. And that could be so simple. But we do have to often ask ourselves, what is the word of God? Because for some people, the word of God is their emotions, their feelings. What they feel is right. What they feel should be. For some people, the word of God is their mind, their reason, their rationale. For other people, the word of God is their bodies, their flesh, or their relationships, their friendships, their socialness. Now, we all know that these are not the word of God, but if you were to look at some churches and how churches react to what is the word of God, it's almost like they've never read it. It's almost like they've never said, I'm going to make this fruitful in my life. In fact, most churches nowadays can operate as if they're nightclubs. Just thrilling, entertaining, Something which we have a nice time or a good time. How was worship for you, brother? I thought worship was excellent. Well, worship's not for you. It's not how we feel. It's not what makes us feel good. It is not what we think. For my thoughts, my ways are different than your ways. And God spoke to humanity through the prophets. But they didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say. Even God's so-called people didn't want to hear what the prophets had to say. But the word of God, it is scripture. But it also became flesh. Revealed in the person of Jesus. He is the fulfillment of the word. He is the one who held every one of these words and not one of them fell. He is the ultimate example of what humanity should be. And he is the ultimate representation of who God is. Without Christ, we wouldn't have a full understanding of who God is. He needed to come. He was promised, even in Scripture. The word of God was spoken, it was oral, it was verbal. The word of God became written. The word of God became flesh. And then the word of God was poured out on his people, for he is the spirit of truth. So that we may have the spirit indwelling in us. So that when we come to times of trouble and times of situation, we're not reliant on our emotions or on our rationale or on our flesh. We're reliant on the Spirit of God that dwells in us. For it says in Acts, when Peter was told by Jesus, what are we to say or what are we to do when we are pulled before judges, kings and rulers who are going to decide the fate of our lives? He said, the Spirit will speak to you and tell you what to say. What to do? The direction of God is not just set in the past. The direction of God is here, now, living with us in the present. When we talk about light or the lamp, it reminds me that the first words that God 
ever spoke that are recorded in Scripture were, let there be light. That is why the light is associated with the Word of God. It is also associated with what is good. We have no understanding of what is good except for the Word of God. For just as it says in Scripture, and God said, let there be light, Genesis 1, 3 to 5, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. So he's given an example. He's showing what goodness is. Because without God's word, there would be no understanding of what goodness is. And if we want to be a holy and good people, we need to understand God's word. It was good. And not only was it good, it separated the day from the night. The light from the darkness. The good from the evil. God does not want his people to be a mixture. Although sometimes we find ourselves in that place. There's a battle going on inside our hearts and in our minds and in our flesh. For us, between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And if we want to work together with God for the forces of good, we need to hear and understand his word. Psalm 119 verses 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet. A lamp for my feet. In other words, it's not about me just going where I want to go. I'm going to go over here. I like it over here. This is where I want to be in life. This is what I want to achieve. These are all my goals and aspirations, all wrapped up in a nice, neat package. But I hear a voice speaking to me. It's just pulling me. No, shh, shh, shh. be quiet. I'm quite happy. I'm quite comfortable. I don't want to move from this place. I have everything I want. I have a nice house. I have a nice job. I have all my children in the right place. Then all of a sudden, boom, the word comes again. And no matter what I'm doing or whatever I'm saying, there's a struggle going on because I know the word of God is speaking and it's lighting my feet and it's saying, you need to go here but I don't want to be in the light just yet. I'm enjoying myself too much. Isaiah 61 to 3 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people's. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Oh, little old me, nobody listens to what I have to say. I'm unimportant. I'm the least in my family. I have nothing to offer. I have no skills, I have no talents. It's all true, but you have a light. And a light that shines in the darkness will overcome the darkness. The darkness will not overcome the light, the light will overcome the darkness. What is the light that's in you? Jesus Christ, through his spirit, who dwells in you. He's the guarantor of your success. He is the comforter. He is the one who will make the way. He is the one who is more than able to make you eloquent in your speech, to make you able in your actions, to make your mind be settled and at peace. Do you let the light shine? 
or do you hide it in a jar of clay? What is the jar of clay? You know, some people could turn around and say, well, it's literally, it's just a jar of clay. It's, it's an expression that Jesus is using. So you don't want to hide your light. But if you actually look at prophetic literature, you look at the scripture, the jars of clay are throughout the Old Testament. First of all, the clay we find very right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Adam was made from the, the clay, the dust, the earth. We also found in Job chapter 33, verse 6, it says that you formed me and shaped me out of the clay. Isaiah 64, verse 8, talks about the potter and the clay. The whole of Jeremiah chapter 18 is about the potter's house and the clay and the clay pot jar. Lamentations 4, 2 is the same. But the one I want us to refer to, just in case you think, well, that's, that's in the Old Testament, Andrew. No, because everybody knows I love the Old Testament. It's also in the New. Romans 9, 20 to 21. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Here we see God is saying to us through the Apostle Paul, God made you who you are. You cannot customize yourself. You are who God made you to be. And that's for his purposes. And his decision alone. Because he's your creator. He's the potter. We are just the clay. So do not apologize for who God made you to be. God made you who you are. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Celebrate it. Revel in it. Because in doing so, you bring glory back to God. One of the most powerful words I ever heard was by a black slave in the middle of the South in America. And his words were simply this. God made me a slave. So I will be the best slave that I could possibly be. The recognition this man had went beyond kings and princes. He knew who was on the throne. He knew who was in control of his life. And yet regardless of the situation and the circumstance that he faced, he was going to give glory to God. And what does it say in his scriptures? The first will be last and the last will be first. If you have a lot in this life, whoa, <laughs> I feel sorry for you. If you have little, it's time to celebrate. He has a lot for you. The first will be last. The kings, the queens, the politicians, those who have all the wealth. But those who are in poverty, God uplifts and takes off the oppression. Judges chapter 7, 15, 16, I think is a very important verse to understand uh, the light that's held in the clay pot or jar. When Gideon heard the dream, in other words, Gideon was about to fight the Midianites. All he had was 300 men. There were thousands of them. But God had made it so because he was about to show to Gideon his power, his ability to overcome the impossible. So Gideon goes down to the Midianite camps because God has instructed him to listen to what the enemy is saying. And the enemy has a dream, and in the dream, he says that this is going to happen in the camp and there's going to be destruction of the Midianites by the hand of Gideon. And in hearing that dream, hearing the word of God coming to an enemy... Gideon all of a sudden has faith. And this is what he says to his people. When Gideon heard the dream and interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and what? Empty 
clay jars. What is in those empty clay jars? It's a light. So when Jesus turns around and he says, oh, no one puts a lamp or a light into a clay jar. Well, Gideon did. What is Jesus saying? What happens next? If you remember the story, Gideon goes up to fight against the Midianites and he shouts out, for the Lord and for Gideon, they break open the jars, the light shines and the enemy panics and starts killing one another. They don't really have to lift a finger because the word of God came to them. He listens to the word of God. He breaks it open and allows his life to be empty so God can use him. And then all of a sudden, the impossible is made possible. Because Gideon emptied himself of his own pride, his own ambition, and embraced God's word, listened to what it did, and put it into practice. This is where we need to be, people. We need to be listening to the word of God. And we need to be emptying our vessels out to glorify him. Just as it says of Jesus, he was poured out for our sins. There was a way made. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 7, for what we preach is not ourselves. In other words, as clay jars, we can keep everything about ourselves. But we need to reveal the light and put it in its right place. But Jesus Christ is our Lord and ourselves is your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let shine out of darkness. It's not a personal, internal faith that we just keep to ourselves. It's something we have to express to others. Made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in what? Jars of clay. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So when Peter is going out and he's walking on the streets and they're all trying to touch him and bow down at him because he's healed the sick, he's helped the blind, he's done all these different things, he's tearing his clothes and saying, no, 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 don't worship me. Worship the one who sent me, who has given me the option because I heard his voice. I spoke his words and I followed his path. And in following his path, this is why the blind see. This is why the captive has been set free. This is why those who've been downtrodden have been uplifted. Because they heard the word of God. And it spoke in season and transformed the situation. So we've talked about the clay jar. We've talked about the light. What about the bed? Now in a biblical understanding, uh, the bed is used for many different things. First of all, it's used to talk about sexuality promiscuity, but also about marriage. Jesus is not talking about this in this particular thing. There are other elements where the bed is used. It's mainly used of inactivity. It's mainly used of sleep, death, death even. That idea that the word of God and when you put it under the bed is the reality is you're trying to hide it. But you're not, you're sleeping on it. You're not being active with it. But we have to also go back in time because we're not talking about a torch which you put under a bed. Because we can sometimes think like that, can't we? We're not even talking about a bed that's off the floor. You know, when I was younger and I was with my kids, you know, you would go under the bed just to see whether there was a monster under the bed or a child. No, that's not that kind of bed. The type of bed that we're dealing with is a mattress that's rolled out. And this mattress is filled with wool and cotton and other material. So if you put a flaming lamp underneath this bed, what's going to happen? Fire. You're likely to get hurt, burn, set the whole house on fire, kill yourself. 
And what Jesus is saying is if you sleep on the word of God, if you're inactive in what God's word is in your life, it's going to hurt you. It's going to cause pain. It's going to cause suffering. Now, some of the times we look at life and we know God is a forgiving God and he is a caring God and he is a loving God. And there are times when I've gone down paths and I've done things which I haven't done or which I have, shouldn't have done. And God has forgiven me for those things that I've done, but I've still got to face the consequences. He's a forgiving God, but he still allows us to face the consequences when we don't listen to his word. And there's many people out there, that they're not really listening to what God is saying to them. They're too busy enjoying their own lives. They've fallen asleep on the word of God, and they're wondering why their lives are a mess. And sometimes they're blaming the enemy when they need to point the finger right back at themselves. But God wants us to be active in his word. Ephesians 5, 12 to 7 says, It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes light. We are living in different times from Paul, aren't we? Because that which is wrong is not just hidden anymore. It's celebrated. It's broadcasted. It's rejoiced in. This is why it says, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The word of God again. Ezekiel 33, verse 7 to 9. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. We are all watch people. Waiting for him to come back. Waiting for him to return. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Matthew 25, 3-7 talking about the ten virgins, five who were foolish, five who were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oils in jars. Again, there's that word jars again. Along with their lamps, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. And the end of the story is they missed the occasion. You know, that, that reality when we ignore God's word and put it on the back burner is we miss out on what God has for us. And ultimately, if we continue to do it, we miss out on life itself. The salvation process. Because salvation is not just asking Jesus into your life. It's a lifestyle that's lived out with Christ. Those who are in him. Possibly one of the best ways to handle God's word is found in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8 to 10. We're talking about the prophet Elisha. The preceding miracle that's happened is that there's jars of vessels. Jars that are filled with oil because the prophet prophesies over a lady's household she has nothing and the oil starts to pour in the jars and he says get as many jars as possible and fill them up with the oil and as they do so there's a miracle that takes place of provision for this lady because she listened to the word of God well he goes on from that scene to another place in a place called Shunem and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal so whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. 
Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay whenever he comes to us. She made room for the word of God to fellowship in her life. And the result for this lady was she was childless. And as a result of her word and her actions and embracing God's word, God made her fruitful. She had a child. Finally, the lampstand. And I want to close with this. Often when we think of lampstands and stuff, we think of household objects. But the lampstand refers to something greater than just a household object. And we find the first lampstand that's talked about is in Exodus chapter 25. Make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer out its base and shaft, and make its flower-like cups, buds and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the side of the lampstands, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on each branch, three on the next. And the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. Then make it seven lamps and set them on it so that they light the space in front of it. Its wick, trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Again, the word of God is dictating to the priest how the lampstand should be in the presence of God, in his place of worship, in his holiness. When Jesus refers to the lampstand, he's talking about worship. Do you worship the word of God? If you worship the word of God, then the light will illuminate your whole life. And I'm not just talking on a Sunday. Worship is not just singing songs to Jesus, clapping your hands, dancing. Worship is being obedient to what he says to you, doing what he wants you to do, and being a servant in your life to his will forevermore. Amen? Amen. I want to close with this. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Shall we stand? Of course, I never mentioned about the lampstand being the churches as well. In Revelation, the seven churches, the presence of God is in his church, in his people. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says this about us. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, forgive us for the times when we've restricted your light, when we've hidden it, Lord Jesus, from those who do not know you, when we've hidden it from ourselves, Lord Jesus, in the pursuit of our own ambitions and selfish ways. Teach us, Lord, to worship you through the obedience to your word. Whether that word be the written word of your scripture or whether it be the promptings of your Holy Spirit. Show us, Lord Jesus, areas in our lives when we have been listening to other words, other voices, whether be they be the voice of emotion, whether they be the voice of our own reason and rationale, or whether they be the voices of our own flesh. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to worship you. And teach us how to be a prophetic people who will proclaim your name to the ends of the earth so that the nations may be your inheritance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 